The 94th episode of Eliza Views is brought to you by the first annual Intergalactic Imagination Connoisseurs Film Festival, the only film festival open to everyone around the universe. If you're an extraterrestrial and enter the festival, we'll waive the $25 entry fee, as long as you, of course, can prove you're actually an extraterrestrial. There's less than three weeks left to enter. Why haven't you made your movie? Oh boy, our Bondathon continues. Yes, yes, yes. Are you excited? I am excited. This is the first James Bond movie I ever saw in a theater. Yeah, I think Roger Moore was my first James Bond, Your watching first... him on TV. Yeah. Yeah. And there were parts of this that I remember. Okay. Well, I'm excited to talk about this. Exciting. Thrilling. Thrilling. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your Viceroy of verisimilitude, and your sommelier of cinema, but it's not my show. My name's Robert Meyer Burnett, but you're not here to see me. You're here to see this lovely creature, and who might you be? I am Elizabeth Gwendolyn Bell, the ace, the arbiter of cinematic excellence, and the enchantress of, of entertainment. <laughs> and here we are. This is Elizabeth Hughes whining about movies, episode number 94. 94. We're celebrating the James Bond films by watching one movie from each of the actors that played Bond. This is our third one. Yeah. Our Roger Moore, our Roger Moore festival. I think The Spy Love Me is my favorite Roger Moore Bond. I can't say which one's my favorite because I don't remember any of them. <laughs> well, it was a return to form after, uh, well, The Man with the Golden Gun had lackluster box office returns, and both Spy Who Loved Me and uh, Man with the Golden Gun, pardon me, Live and Let Die and Man with the Golden Gun were, were flat films. They weren't widescreen, and this was a return to the widescreen epic bonds. Lewis Gilbert uh, directed You Only Live Twice, and this is kind of a remake of that movie uh -huh. from 67 to 77, 10 years later. Uh -huh. This is the 10th James Bond film. Wow, 10. The main title track was the first time a main title track was not named after the film itself. Oh. I mean, there was no song Dr. No, but they didn't have a song. I mean, they had Underneath the Mango Tree, but for the title tune, this was not called Spy Who Loved Me. It was Nobody Does It Better. It was nominated right. for an Academy Award. You know what it lost to? What? You Light Up My Life. So many nights. <laughs> what, was, what film was that in? By my window. You Light Up My Life. Oh, that was the name of the film? Yeah. Because you light up my life. I love that song. I don't you know the movie, You bring though. me hope <laughs> to carry on. Okay. You Keep light going. up my... I don't remember the lyrics. <laughs> I don't even know why I remember that many of the lyrics. I have oh, no idea. On, it's a great song. Uh, I don't know about that. You know, we're supposed to drink on this show. Yeah, come on. And, let's uh, get to it. I don't know it. if this is... Uh, we're going to get to it now. Got us uh, some organic This is not wine. organic wine. This is a Bonterra Cab Sauv made with organic grapes. Now, how did you find this? Well, this one I got at Vons. What? This, this one, I was looking for organic wines while I was waiting for my shipment of organic wines that... Um, I thought this was going to be one of those shipper... No, this was the, the pre-shipment organic wine. Ah. But I ordered six bottles of wine organic from Thrive Market. Where oh, is that an online market? It is. Are they supporting the show? They're not. We just gave them a free advertisement. I I mean, you know. Cheers to that. Maybe but they'll support it. Cheers to the return of the form of the epic Bond movie. Spy Lubby, Roger Moore's third outing as Bond. Probably I mean, I really like the way he portrayed the character. They wrote him more as a more of a more more like he, he was trying to play Connery in the last two movies, yeah. but this time they kind of wrote the movie to him, to his strengths. And I thought his portrayal of Bond is great. Yeah. I, and I love Barbara Bach, Ringo Starr's wife. Mm-hmm. Great Bond girl, one of the best. Can match Bond for Bond, uh, pound, bond match Bond, well, not quite pound for pound because she's a little diminutive, but... <laughs> But she 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 is is almost as equal, certainly as intellectual equal, even yeah. though she's hurting from the fact that her lover was killed by Bond in Berggarten three weeks before this yeah. movie starts. And she wants to kill him, but not really. By the way, her lover uh, was played by Michael Billington, who was Paul Foster in UFO. And speaking of UFO, Jerry Anderson himself, the creator of 
Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet and UFO submitted a treatment for this movie because Ian Fleming did not want them to use the original story, The Spy Who Loved Me, because it was told from a woman's perspective. So he only gave them the rights to use the title. So they had to come up with a brand new story. So on the credits, this doesn't say Ian Fleming's James Bond. It just says James Bond 007. I know. There's lots. Of, there's a lot of interesting stuff about this have movie. Have you read that, the original story? I have read the original story. And? <clears throat> it's not very and, good. Well, it's why not, don't we try our wine? Let's try our wine. Sorry. Uh, cheers to the movie again. Mmm. Um, oh. this is quite good. It is. So, Elizabeth, this movie begins with one of the more celebrated pre-title sequences in a Bond film. And what I love about actually the pre-title sequence in this movie is kind of is it's 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 long. And and it sets up an epic scope. We go from a a British submarine, I believe the the yeah. Venture, uh, or the Rain no the Venture Ranger, right? Uh is kidnapped yes in the middle of the ocean a la what specter did in in you only live twice when they stole capsules from orbit the laparis this we don't know that yet but a giant we don't know what's happened to it but it's disappeared and then we we go to moscow yes and we meet general gogol again Mm -hmm. and i love general gogol um and and he finds out that a russian submarine has also gone missing right so now there are two subs missing and and uh, so, then we meet two agents, Anya Amasova, Triple X. Yes. And she is with her lover, and uh, she a gets... really hairy dude. <laughs> Michael Billington, Paul Foster. He's very hairy. He, yeah, but he's a handsome dude. He's handsome, but he's very. Hairy. Dudes are hairy, man. Well, no, this one's really hairy. <laughs> well, anyway, um, and then we meet Bond. <laughs> he's uh, in Berengarten. Yeah. He's in a he's in a uh, he's in a cabin with a very hot chick, and he gets summoned. They both get summoned while they're doing it. And then <laughs> and then what's interesting is we just watched Honor Majesty's Secret Service, yeah, which had great skiing in it. Yes. This also they brought back Willie Bogner to design the ski sequence and shoot it. Yeah. And is, they, that, is that why you picked this one? Because there's a ski sequence. No, this is my favorite. This is my favorite Roger Moore Bond. It's the first Bond because I saw in the there's theater. There's a ski sequence. Well, no, but the, the opening, people said when this movie first played for, when Prince Charles first saw this movie, everybody in the theater stood up when the Union Jack opened up wow. in the, in the, uh, in the theater <laughs> and, and applauded. Cause how can you not? How could you not? Uh, and it, it, what I love about the, this opening sequence is it makes the movie feel big. It does. You know, it's not just Bond blowing something up or killing somebody or whatever before you even get to Bond. You um, a, a nuclear submarine is, is kidnapped, and you go from from the British Naval Command and yeah. Other <laughs> things I like about this movie is is Bond is a naval commander, and you see him in like naval shipyards, and he's yeah. a veteran. It's he Veterans knows, Day. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. I really like that. Yeah. So then. Um, yeah. So he skis from the cabin where he was just you know getting it on, and um, is chased by a bunch of. Agents. Russians. Russians. The KGB. And they're shooting at him, and he jumps off a cliff, and thank God he has a parachute with a British flag on it. A parachute with the British, the Union Jack, yes, and uh, it's great. Very, very cool. Another great Maurice Binder opening title sequence. Yes. Dancing great song. Naked ladies hanging from guns this time. Hanging from guns. <laughs> you know, who knew you could do gymnastics off the gun right. barrel of a of a Luger. They were. Oh, they were. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's good. Yeah. So, both Anya Amasova and Bond are sent to Egypt. They are. To meet somebody named Aziz Fekesh, who yes. apparently has, they, they discover that somebody has a way of tracking nuclear submarines while they're at sea. Right. It's a tracker for submarines, and somehow the plans for it have gotten out and um people are trying to buy it and we also get to meet in this opening sequence we get to meet um carl stromberg 
the shipping magnet, the richest, one of the richest men in the world, played by Kurt Jurgens, or Kurt Jurgens, but Kurt Jurgens was in an awesome submarine movie called The Enemy Below. Oh. Where he was he was in battle with a, a ship on the surface, but he played the commander of the U boat. So he is no stranger to movies with submarines in yeah, them. Yeah, what's up with that? He's stealing submarines in this movie. The last time he was a German U boat commander. And he'd previously worked with director Louis Gilbert, so they... I, and, you know, a lot of people don't like... They, they don't think of Stromberg as one of the great villains in the Bond pantheon because he's not that proactive. He's not. He likes to sit at his very long table uh, in his underwater... Um, in Atlantis, his underwater city, <laughs> which is one of the coolest things. Very Jerry Anderson, very Derek Meddings, and he, Professor uh, uh, Bankman and Markovitz that have created the submarine tracking system... He sends them on their way and finds out that his secretary... Well, yeah, okay, so they are, he's paid them each $10 million, and but then said uh, the plans have gone out and somebody's trying to sell the plans, and then he tells his assistant to leave the room, and she goes into the elevator. There's a trap door, and he opens the trap door, and she is eaten by a shark. She's eaten by a shark, and there's an interesting thing in this movie that... that, that you don't really notice it. Carl Stromberg has webbed hands. And that's why he doesn't like to shake hands. In the movie, he won't shake your hand. But you oh. don't really see it in the film. Oh. He's got webbed hands. Well, why didn't they show it? You know, I, I always wonder about that. They, they never do like a real close-up about his webbed hands. But what are you going to do? Like really webbed? Like genetically? Uh... Yeah, like he's like, you know, like the penguin or something. He's part. If if he wasn't an international shipping magnet, he probably would have been the penguin and lived in Gotham City and tormented uh, Bruce Wayne. But instead, he's a problem for James Bond and Anya Masova. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have some <laughs> interesting thoughts about his plan, his his evil plot. Well, should we, we can get into that? It doesn't matter. People have seen this movie. I mean. So he, wants, he, he wants to build an underwater city, so why doesn't he just go ahead and build his underwater city? Why does he have to blow up New York and London? I mean, no New one's York and Moscow. Oh, Moscow, sorry. To precipitate World War III. Why? Why? He could still he could he could just build his underwater city. Nobody's stopping him. Well, he kind of already has done that. So what's the problem? Why does he have to start World War III? Well, because he wants to wipe out the surface dwellers. That's silly. Why? If you're underwater, you wouldn't even know there were surface dwellers. Well, yeah, and but he even said he never leaves his. But we're we, we're polluters. We kill. We, we the Great Barrier Reef is dying because. You think we... he cares about the environment? He's blowing. He's shooting off nukes. Yeah, but he knows the sea will eventually cleanse the uh, cleanse the world. Okay. Look, he's a megalomaniac. He's got a screw loose. You can't expect <laughs> he does him have to a like. Screw loose I don't know what to tell and you. Webbed hands. <laughs> he's got a screw loose and webbed hands. Now, what I so this movie, I love some of the scenery in this film. Yeah. It's got some great scenery, and of, of course, the first place they go is to uh, Egypt. Yes. Yes. And first of all, Bond makes a stop and and, and meets a friend of his, a sheikh, who 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 who's got apparently, even though he's in Egypt, has a selection of very like models from Victoria's Secret. Doesn't matter, but uh, it, they're pretty hot. Yeah, are they like out in the desert in a tent? Yeah, but he like knows everything. He's like the... And Bond visits him because he's got his nose to the grindstone. He knows ear, ears to the whatever. Okay. He knows everything. So it's, he goes to him to get the information. I think it, they just wanted to show pretty women in... Uh, yeah. Egyptian garb uh, yeah. and those, in, in those... a tent with carpets all over the place. And the woman that Bond apparently spends a night with is super hot. She kind of walks in, diminutive. Are you, are you sure I can't interest you in a bed for the night? Oh. Well, when you're in Egypt, you have to delve into it, her pleasures. Oh, I see. They, did, they didn't show it, but they... They didn't show it, but they show you this girl walk out, you know, with the most mid exposed midriff of all exposed well, yeah. midriffs. Can't go even a little bit more. It's pretty great. So and then and then uh, and then uh, Bond goes in to find his connection to get to Fakesh. Yes. And uh, uh, there's all kinds of shenanigans going on, and also well, Stromberg. Well, at that point he meets um, the Russian girl. Right, but well, not yet. But Stromberg has sent out 
Jaws. We meet Jaws for the first time. And and basically, uh, someone who looks like the thing oh, right. from the they're Fantastic at an, Four. At an event where they're explaining, I don't know, it's like this big... Well, Stromberg, thing. after he kills Professor Markovitz, he sends them out. He says, look, anybody who, look, anybody who finds the submarine tracking plans, kill them all. Right. So he sends out, to not just eat. him, but like some other dude too. yeah the cue ball guy the thing yeah. i always call him the thing kind of like in reservoir dogs <laughs> motherfucker looks just like the thing he's like ben Grimm. he looks like ben Grimm. he, he looks like an ugly michael chiklis from the shield yeah, so he sends the a, shield guy out and he yeah. sends jaws out yeah as a as a team yep but they don't last very long well jaws does jaws does but michael chick evil michael chiklis yeah, doesn't last very long they fight and fight and then what he throws them off the roof or something? Well, he's holding. Yeah, they have a they have a fight. Oh yeah, he's holding onto his tie. Where's Fekesh? K- K- yeah. Cairo. And then he falls off the mount. He, he falls, falls off the. You know. He didn't have to tell him he was going to fall anyway. Well, he hoped Bond might save him. So yes, so so. My question is, how could Bond hold on? That guy was like really like a stocky, stocky guy. He was a stocky guy. How did he hold him with his tie? How did he not go over with him? Well, I mean, uh, you know, you counter, uh, counter, le- a, a counterweight, not counter lever, but count- <laughs> you know, he's leaning back and the guy's catapult. <laughs> yeah, well, he catapulted off. But um, so, long story short, they end up going to the pyramid show, and and Bond right. sees Anya Amasova meeting with their connection. Yes, and they're talking, and then um, then the guy notices Jaws. In the the guy lights, noticed because there's lights like shining on the pyramids, and, and in an interesting the 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 narrator who is narrating the the Egyptian show yeah. is actually Patrick McNee, John Steed from the Avengers, the show the Avengers, who was later in in uh, View to a Kill, and he also played Count Ibley uh, a year later in Battlestar Galactica. Not that that matters to anybody. Except this crowd well, that's watching I, right I now. Well, I love that you know all this about these people. It's just mind blowing. <laughs> well, so yes, please continue with that. Well, no, and it's it's pretty cool. Like they 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 were gonna shoot this thing. They, the the pyramid, the lighting with the pyramids didn't work, so the pyramids in the movie are actually miniatures. Oh. So it's all you know. There's a there's a lot of really great miniature work. Hmm. Like I love all of the stuff at sea. Sometimes it's it's obvious because. The scale of water and miniatures is hard to deal with, but there's some. I think the miniature work in this film is quite beautiful, actually. Yeah, yeah, I, big, I would agree with that. I'm you're not, you're fan. not distracted by it. it. It's not even something I like. You don't consciously like. Oh, that's a miniature. Right. No, and it, and and so, you know, they have a few run-ins. Well, he, yeah. Here's another question. Okay, so the guy spots Jaws, and he freaks out, and instead of running away he runs towards where he's where the guy is well he's gonna lie he's, he thinks by locking himself you know in in i mean it's a, okay it's a, <laughs> it might what? be a little sketchy why or stay with the crowd like there's a whole crowd of people there well yeah but when the crowd dissipates what are you gonna do where are you gonna go jaws will find Run you towards him jaws is the original terminator he is he's the original terminator he keeps coming he does yeah. Yeah, he freaked me out when I was a kid. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, you know... Um, yeah, so he runs towards him, and, um, of course, Jaws kills him. And this is where uh, James Bond meets the Russian girl. James Bond meets the Russian girl. I, and, uh, um, you know, they they're, they're, they are taken... It's it, There's a lot of, like, there's a lot of sort of dangling plot threads, like... When Jaws, he knows he's got them, and he takes them to these beautiful ruins. I mean, they filmed at Karnak, they filmed in, they filmed in a lot of Egyptian ruins. It's really cool. Uh huh. But so Jaws takes them out there, and they're the, the, the way they shoot the ruins is beautiful. They really make good use of these Egyptian yeah, yeah, it's locations, beautiful. and it, mm-hmm. it, it is it's it's really great. And Marvin Hamlish, who wrote the score for this movie. I really like the score for this movie. You got the yeah. disco Bond theme, the Bond seventy seven theme that they play when Bond is skiing. I mean, I like the score for this, but like the music over the pyramid sequences is is the pyramid sequence is good. Well, they mix like classical music with 
disco music. Yeah. It's kind of a mashup of stuff. Yeah, it, it, it is. It is. But and it's I, all great. And Marva Hamblish and Carol Bayer Sager, I mean, she wrote uh, Nobody Does It Better, and it was sung by Carly Simon. So it's basically, I, I mean, this movie in a way, the same way that, that Honor Majesty's Secret Service is like peak 60s, this movie was sort of peak 70s. Yeah. Roger Moore suits... You know, his outfits and all that. It, yeah. I mean, he's got great... He's he's constantly changing his clothes in this movie. <laughs> and you do get to see him in his yes, naval naval uniform as well. <laughs> yes, you do. But, but the peak 70s, whether they're leisure suits or... It's... Yeah, yeah, totally. It's, it, the 70s style. Barbara Box hair. Peak Charlie's Angels era <laughs> 70s. It's not feathered like Farrah it's Fawcett. It's feathered, but, but it she's is got 70s, totally for sure. 70s. And mm-hmm. it's it's... And I mean, her bras and her dresses are just barely hanging off her ample bosom, which is great, isn't it? What do you mean? Well, the way the way her cleavage is always threatening oh, to expose right, itself. Right, right, I mean, right. I don't even know how whether she's wearing a nightgown or a dress. It looks like her dress is about to just fall off her boobs. <laughs> I, I mean, it's fantastic. Rob is peak nineties. Rob is peak 90s. I'm peak 90s? What does that mean? I think I kind of look... I I look like late uh, season 5 Sonny Burnett. Come on. Yeah, you're kind of 80s, babe. Yeah, Miami Vice. Your hair feathered like that? Late 80s, man. Come on. And this... um... My my Snake Plissken uh, redolent of Snake Plissken's jacket. People love this jacket. Where are your Ray-Bans? You should wear your Ray-Bans. I lost them. You're kidding. No, remember I, lo- I lost my Ray-Bans. Dude. I'll get them back, you know. Get them back? You don't even know where they are. I know, I lost them. I'll, I mean, I'll buy them. I'll buy another pair. With my, uh... No. Where did they you go? You can get fake ones now. I would never wear fake Ray-Bans. Anyway, so so, so Bond and Anya Amasova, they have to get a lot of shenanigans, a lot of fights with Jaws and everything, and they, they finally get... They, they they finally get the microfilm that has the submarine tracking system on it as they elude Jaws. And, right. And uh, then they eventually meet up in more Egyptian ruins, where which is uh, a conceit that I love no matter where they go. I, I love this in, like, You Only Live <laughs> so Twice. Funny. And You Only Live Twice, they go into this half-sunken boat, but there's M's office. Right, right. You know, and, 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 and it's great because Money Penny's outside, and Bond is he in? And and Money Pan is like, go on in, James. And there is General Gogol in M's office, which is Egyptian ruins with uh, hieroglyphs all over the walls. Oh, it's great. <laughs> and what's so funny is they introduce like I think this is the first, the first Bond film with Frederick Gray, and the the the, the actor who succeeds uh, Bernard Lee as M is in this movie, but he plays a naval commander. And also from Young, uh, from Honor Majesty's Secret Service, the guy who plays Hillary Bray is also in the. I mean, they've they've got a Bond company of character actors that they keep using, and right, uh, right. I I love that. But so, their Bond, and Anya Masova meet with M and General Gogol. And they talk about what they're going to do. Yeah, they're teaming up. The Russians and the Brits are teaming up. They're teaming up, and and they're Bond and a uh, Triple X are, are trying to outdo each other. Who knows more? And and Gogol's impressed. Walter Gotel, who plays General Gogol, is amazing. He was actually in a first season episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation. Oh, really? Home Soil, the episode where aliens, the alien, the nanobots or whatever, the the oh, living yeah. sand say, "Ugly bags of mostly water." You love that episode. General Gogol's in that. General Gogol was supposed to be in The Living Daylights, which is our next movie that we're going to watch, but Walter Gotell was in poor health, so John Rhys Davies plays General Pushkin uh... and not General Gogol, which is sad because it would have been, not that I don't love John Rhys Davies, but it would have been nice if General Gogol would have been in The Living Daylights. Yeah. Smirch Spionin. Death to spies. Anyway. Anyway, <laughs> so so Bond and Anya Masova uh, uh, are now are are they now are going to go? They they there's a great they're on the train together. They've teamed up and uh, they Jaws is on the train and there's there's a great train fight that also harks back to from Russia with Love. Yes, which is cool. And then they, they finally they they throw they toss get, them out the window toss out the train and then <laughs> they make it to Sardinia. 
Yes. Where Sandine. they're and they're going to go bond. Uh, uh, he uh, is impersonating a marine biologist, and they're going to go. And who do we meet? Who works? Who works for Stromberg? But one of the hottest women on the planet in the seventies, Caroline Monroe, who plays Naomi, who stars in Star Crash. I have an action figure of it right over there. But before he meets her, doesn't he get the car from Q? He does. He get, well, why don't you tell us about that car? The Lotus Esprit. Very cool car. Voted the second best Bond car after the DB5. It's what I remember most about this movie when I was a kid. It like stuck in my memory. The car that the wheels would go in and it would go underwater. The submarine car. <laughs> and then Jaws too. And when he bit the with bit, when he bit the shark, I remember that. Yeah. Well, there you go, and you got to see it again. So yeah, Q uh, Major Boothroyd gives uh, Q gives uh, the 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 Lotus Esprit. I don't know if it's turbo. We do see a Lotus again in uh, For Your Eyes Only. Oh, cool. Which is cool. The, and and that, the really cool Lotus, like it's like maroon, wine-colored. Yeah. It gets blown up in the beginning, but oh, it's, that's too, sad. it's too bad. Um, but yeah, so we, he gets the car, and they check into this badass hotel in Sardinia. And as they're, you know, they're talking, and they're all lovey-dovey, then Triple uh, X notices Bond's lighter. And says, where'd you get that? Oh, I got it in Austria. Oh, right. I was in Berengarden doing some skiing three weeks ago. The jig is up. What is what does Triple X know now? Well, that's after they... You no, skipped a lot. Whatever. Anyway, so yeah, she figures out that he killed her lover. He killed her lover, and what does she say to him? She's going to kill him. When this that's mission's, over, the mission's I, over, I'm going to kill you. I will him. kill you. Mm-hmm. And then they're helicoptered down into the submarine. Yes. They will they take a boat. A boat? No. Yeah, they take a boat to the they no, they don't oh no. they don't that doesn't happen they're yet. They're lowered in. No right after the scene where she says I'm gonna kill you, they're like glued together because they're being lowered to the submarine. No. I remember because the transition of her saying I'm going to kill you and then the very next scene is they're being lowered into the submarine and they're like together like this on the rope. No, man. They haven't even gone to Carl Stromberg's. They have not gone to you Atlantis yet. You skipped all that. That's what I told you. You skipped a bunch of stuff and you're like, uh. No, no. We have to go and they have to go meet Carl Stromberg. Well, that happened before she said I'm going to kill you. Did it? I thought it happened yeah. after. All right. No. I could be wrong. Even though we just watched the movie. So anyway, then yes, but they go to, no, they go no, to. No, no. Okay. So they get on the submarine and the submarine gets sucked in by the ship. The, and wait, that's wait, when they wait, end wait, up. Wait a minute. You're so not there yet at all. We're, that's, that happens way later. <laughs> it does. You're way the one later. who skipped around. When you, when she discovers that he's the one who killed her lover, that's like right before they get on the submarine. Okay. Perhaps that is. It's after the the car turns into a boat. Yeah, we're not even there yet. We're, right, we're, we're not. You're the one who skipped. <laughs> I wasn't skipping over. See, that. confirmed. Rob is wrong. <laughs> okay, I might be wrong, but they 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 have to get to Sardinia. They get the Thank car. Thank you, right? They check BLL. into the hotel. Yes. And they're gonna go meet Stromberg. Right. Okay, so maybe they find it finds out later. All right. <laughs> Either way. Took a little nap, did we? I did not take a little nap. So, so um, we, we, yes, we have to go. We, Naomi, I was going to say, Caroline Monroe is where I was at. They meet Caroline Monroe, who takes them by boat out to Atlantis. Right, exactly. And he's posing as a marine biologist with his wife. And he goes and meets him, and um, Jaws sees them and confirms that it was the couple that he chased on the train. Yeah, but there's this great, I mean, there's a great, there's a great meeting where where Stromberg is testing Bond, <laughs> you know, as a marine pilot, and and Bond's like, you have right. many, you have many. So they go they go to the underwater city, yeah, and they find out they see it, and Naomi is giving a, a tour to Triple X, and Bond goes to meet uh, Stromberg, and and yeah. Stromberg's like, do you recognize this fish? Yeah, and he points to a lionfish. Yeah, and, and what is he? And at first, Bond doesn't respond. And you think, oh, shit, he doesn't know what kind of fish that is. What kind of marine biologist is he? But then finally he says, like, the technical name for the fish and that it's uh, quills on the back of its... Um, the dorsal spines, uh, venomous. Are, are very venomous. 
But what's interesting is, and I've never, even as a kid, I didn't like this scene because they meet and nothing really happens. Like, he's just, I oh, wanted yeah. to meet they you. they talk and, for like two minutes. They talk for two minutes. And he sends him away. And he goes, I'm busy now. I got to go. So, Bond. Good luck with your project. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's like, are you going to fund me? Like, there's no, they don't have any fun. I it's thought like, that was weird, too. Was yeah, like, it's, uh, even when I saw this in the theater, I was waiting for like, is he going to play golf? Like Goldfinger? You know, well, I, you know, when you meet somebody that likes the same things as you and is an expert in the same things that you are, you talk for hours. Right. And I think that <coughs> the the weakest the weakest link in this movie is this is really the only time Bond and Stromberg are together. You right. know, and, and they're not they're not um, uh, uh, until like the end, but they don't. There's no there's no back and forth between them. And and that's always fun when Bond and the villain have some back and forth. I mean, this is a scene that it's not and he meets him once and then he meets him at the end of the movie. You know, and it's not like it's it's not like the Goldfinger stuff, the golf scene. Like I I think that one of the staples of a Bond movie is Bond has to have an extended scene with the villain. They have to have some kind of 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 and Christopher Wood, who co-wrote the screenplay, who later who went on to write Moonraker as well. I mean, there is there. Hugo Drax has more back and forth in Moonraker. Moonraker is basically a remake of this, which is a remake of <laughs> just an outer space. You only love, yeah, I mean, and, and by the way, the end of this movie does say at the end. The credits say the end of of Spy Who Me, but James Bond will return. At the end of this movie, it says for your eyes only. That was going to be the movie. It's in the movie. It's in the end of the credits, but because Star Wars was so successful, they decided to make Moonraker and go into space. Your favorite. Uh, well, yeah, maybe I'll. You know, I found my drunk Moonraker commentary. Maybe I'll. Maybe I'll put it up as an Elizaview special. <laughs> like drunk Moonraker comment, which would kind of be funny. It would be hilarious. It'd be hilarious. I mean, now, now that we do whining about movies, people wouldn't care. Like, oh, he's just sauced right. doing his Moonraker <laughs> you were commentary. You very sauced. I was so drunk. <laughs> you should totally put it up. Totally. I will put it up. It'll be kind of funny. Mm-hmm. I'll never get a corporate job. There's so much shit on, on you on the internet. Like, pff, forget it. <sighs> yeah, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So they go and they they go out there and, and Bond, they leave. They're taken back and... Stromberg brings Jaws in and says, "Is this, uh, is this them?" And Jaws is like, "Yep, yeah, that's pretty much." I mean, he doesn't say it, but so Stromberg knows that Triple X and Bond are who they are. Right. And um, he basically says, "No, okay, kill him. Go kill him. Go kill him. Let them get to the mainland. Why would you even wait till he gets to the mainland? That's silly. But anyway, let them get to the mainland and then kill." Oh, because we need an awesome action sequence. Yeah, we do. <laughs> And and it it, it yeah and it, it so is. they're in the in the car and um, they're driving up this winding road and a motorcycle is chasing them with a sidecar side that's car. a missile yeah and then he launches the sidecar and it blows up a truck that's that they just swerved around it's pretty amazing it's pretty cool another great Derek Meddings model explosion when the truck explodes. Mm. There's actually, I think, a real truck and then a fake truck, a model truck, and and uh, again, and then it, it 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 builds. You've got the motorcycle, then you have Jaws and his henchmen, right? And then you have Naomi in the black Stromberg helicopter, helicopter. the Hughes the Hughes helicopter. And, yeah. You know, Corgi. And she like waves to him and and winks at him as she's shooting at them. Oh, it's great. And and I have to say, as a kid, Corgi, the 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 British die cast company, made an awesome they they made two die cast toys from spy love me they made the lotus and the lotus transformed do you have it uh, i used to i don't have it anymore i mean i but it transformed and they also made the black stromberg hughes helicopter that had the logo on the side and it fired it fired the same the the lotus had missiles in the back these little tiny red missiles that it fired a long way. As far as toy missiles go, it's pretty potent. Wow. And then the, the, the helicopter had, had two missiles in the front too. They were great. Of course, you know, I collected 
Corgi and Dinky toys, that, and my parents, have, I, I'm like, oh my god, you know, my mom's like, I know, I'll put it on your, your Christmas, Hanukkah <laughs> list, yeah, I know, you know, it, I didn't have to tell them how much, because Corgi, they made the they made the moon buggy from Diamonds Are Forever, they made the DB5 from Goldfinger that had all the gadgets, I mean, they, Corgi hooked you up, when you're a kid, this is important. Yeah. I wish I had had those toys. <laughs> well, and they were great. They were great toys. But it's a it's a great action sequence. You know, the, the Lotus. Yeah. And then at the end of it, at the end of it, the helicopters, Naomi's chasing him down, and the the car. And I'll, I'll never forget, like, I don't, I don't think I saw a trailer for this movie when I... So when the way they direct, the way they film, the way Gilbert directs the sequence... Um, the it, it, they build up to it, like you're driving off the thing, and it's it's really great when the car goes into the ocean. It does, and and you don't know, like I didn't yeah. see, it. I just knew it was coming out. Well, it left such an impression on me; it like stuck with me my whole life. And the transformation of the car underwater is the best. Yes, I mean it it's, really is. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. And 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 then of course, I mean, I, I hate this, but. The first thing Bond does is kill, blows up the helicopter and kills Caroline Monroe. I'm so sorry. It's terrifying. It's it's just not good. Aww. I, I know. What are you going to do? She but you know what? She had to go. She was trying to kill him. Two years later, Star Crash came out. She was scantily clad. She starred in that movie. I don't know that movie. We should watch it for whining about movies. We should. All you would do is whine. It's not really worth... I love it, though. And so she dies... And then, then okay, then they go back to their hotel room, having survived, and that's when they have the conversation. That's when they have the conversation. And that's when she realizes that you killed my lover. Right. Yes. In the very next scene, after she says, I'm going to kill you, is they're like glued together on the rope and being lowered to the submarine. Just like Jack Ryan in, in, in uh, Hunt for Red October. Yes, Exactly. And, and and we have to give a shout out to the commander of the American submarine, sh the actor Shane Rimmer, who did the voice. He was like this expat American that shows up in Bond films a lot. The voice of uh, one of the Thunderbirds. I mean, he was in so many different things. I think he was in Stuart Gordon's Space Truckers. I mean, he's awesome. <laughs> and he's the captain of the American sub. He is. Yeah. And and so they're they're going out to to investigate this ship. They don't know what's up with this ship yet. Right. And they replay kind of the scene that we saw at the beginning when the British submarine yep. and the American submarine gets swallowed by the Laparis, the yes. the Stromberg's gigantic. And and we get the first glimpse. They built the famous 007 set uh, where they had three nuclear submarines. This gigantic soundstage at Pinewood Studios that was used for so many things. Um, and I think it was, it was, it burned down when they made Legend. Oh. Really Scott's Legend. I think it was, maybe it was something else, but I think it was Legend. And then they rebuilt it. But it's one of the great sets for any movie, you know. And, uh, they get, they get kidnapped. They get sucked in and they've got these, these, they've got the Russian nuclear submarine, the British nuclear submarine, now the American nuclear <laughs> submarine. It's one of each. All, you know, three Quite subs. A collection. <laughs> and they're holding the, the crews of these ships. Yes, they are. And and then we do meet, we, you know, we do meet Stromberg again. And, yeah. of course, he has to monologue and explain his plan. His evil plan. <laughs> his evil plan. And what is his evil plan? To build this underwater city. And he, he wants to uh, blow up New York and Moscow. Well, he's going to shoot. He's going to take two of these nukes. Oh, no, I'm good. Thank oh, you. Okay. And I know you're good, but you want some more wine. <laughs> are, are you going to shoot? They're going to shoot. They're going to nuke... Uh, Moscow and New York. They are. To start a nuclear They're war. They're going to nuke them. Kind of like in the movie Failsafe, which we should also watch, because I have that on Blu-ray now. Okay. Um, but, but um, yeah, so that that there's their plan. So the cruise bond has to help the crews escape. They have to take over the ship. They have to figure out a way. And, and of course, they send out, they send out um, the British sub and the Russian sub to take positions to launch their missiles. Right. So they're going out. They're they're going out. They are. But in but before that happens, the Russian girl gets taken by the evil dude. Stromberg. 
and back he to Atlantis. Takes her, yeah. And he ties her to a chair. First, he puts on this little tiny little top and red pants and straps her to a chair. Well, but the but yes, but I have to say that 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 one of the great things, like when I saw this movie, I just turned eleven. So I was eleven. I think this came out in July of seventy-seven. So I just turned eleven. Everything that's in the last forty-five minutes of this movie was one of the most. It was just everything about it was awesome. You know, when when they when they when when Stromberg takes Triple X out of the ship, they they have a motorboat, but it it doesn't leave the ship in the water. It gets ejected out of the side. <laughs> it blows this these things blow open, and then it lands in the water. And then you see the the battle sequence. I thought the battle sequence at the end of this movie was everything an eleven year old boy wants out of life. <laughs> You've got James Bond in a naval uniform. Yes. You've got th- well every girl wants to see that too. You got three different crews. You got a Russian, a British, and American crew. You've got these these guys that look like they're from the mothership in V in their weird, you know, <laughs> cost the the Stromberg army, orange. whatever they are. The, they're wearing orange they're jumpsuits. They're paramilitary. Yeah, they're orange jumpsuits. And there's just this long protracted battle in this gigantic yeah. set. And it's, you know, Bond movies are always the best when they have big battles at the end. Whether it's the battle in the volcano and you only live twice. I'm sure Lewis Gilbert was like, bruh. He directed Moonraker, Moonraker too. So I'm sure Lewis Gilbert was like, we should have a battle. Like at the end of, and of, and of course they do. Yes. And when you've mm-hmm. got these giant battles, whether it's you've got an army of female ninjas like at the end of Octopussy. I, I mean, battle giant battles at the end of Bond movies are always the best. Yes, they are. And then Bond has to get a, a nuclear detonator out of, out of one of the... Polaris yes. missiles to get through the the the, the so they steel can get door. So into the command center, and um, yeah, so he succeeds to uh, get in there, and somehow this this bomb like blows a hole through the wall so he can get through. But somehow it killed everybody in that room. It's a big it's a big bomb. I guess it's a, it's a de- hey, look you, to to for a Polaris missile. You, you gotta go with it. It's Bond movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then of course they realize they've got four minutes. Yes. And Bond's like, we can reprogram the. We'll we'll just tell the subs to target each other. Yeah. Yeah. And Which you know, they do in three minutes. And, and it's um, great. <laughs> and there's this giant golden globe with. Well, the sets the <laughs> sets in this movie are so great. Yeah. I mean the giant, this giant globe that you know has the subs on it, and it's just—I yeah. mean, and you I see, cannot. You see the lights of the missiles going across like this. I cannot tell you though that I when I when I was watching this with you tonight, um, uh, before not tonight when we were before we, we when we watched this before the show, I, I I just was reliving my childhood, and I'm thinking, okay, I had only seen James Bond movies on television. Yeah, me too. At four by three NTSC resolution, and to see this widescreen because I'd never seen a widescreen, I'd never seen Thunderball in the theater, I'd never seen You Only Live Twice in the theater, I'd never seen Diamonds Are Forever or Honor Majesty's Secret Service, which were all widescreen Panavision two three five to one movies, and I saw this at the John Dance Theater where I saw Superman the movie and Logan's Run and Star Trek the Motion Picture. It was a huge, it was in a huge screen. Yeah. I mean, it was just huge. And seeing this movie as an 11 year old who loved James Bond for the first time in the theater, this was like, and, and keep in mind, I had seen Star Wars two months before. So the whole, the movie going experience for me had become almost like I was seeing God. It was, it was, it was like being in a church. And and it was like being in a, a tent revival, and I, I'm like an 11 year old kid going, "This is the most fucking awesome shit I've ever seen." You were actually this saying is that. Aw- no, but I was thinking. It. <laughs> you were thinking. I that was at thinking. 10. I'm I'm this battle at the end. Dudes are getting hand grenades are going off, and people are being blown off railings into the water. Machine gun fire. I mean, this the end of this movie for an 11 year old was everything I'd ever dreamed of. In a James Bond movie. I mean, it was, to me, it was, because, you know, when you're watching Bond films with commercials, yeah, you, you know, you're waiting for, but you could never truly get into them. You couldn't, you couldn't be immersed in the world because it's like, and now have some Crest toothpaste. 
So that's I, true. You know, I, I I'd never seen. Yeah, but seen... then you could go to the kitchen and get a snack. Yeah, but you, but the thing was, you couldn't immerse yourself. It, it was, I, I I I didn't know what it was like to see a James Bond movie in the theater where you could allow yeah. all of this, the exotic locations, and they're huge and larger than life, and the sound is explosive, and it's it was amazing. So this film made such an impression on me, like it, 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 underwater city, you know, and it it, it just. I loved this movie. I lo- I still love it. You know, uh, thirty th- or forty three years later, <laughs> I still love this movie. And at the end, you ca- I I can't get enough. I I just now I know that is this movie great. There's a lot of it that's not great. I mean, it yeah. it, it goes from goofy stuff to, but for me, I I I cannot help. But this this movie is evocative of, of of a period of time when I was, I I, I went from being just a, a kid who loved movies to somebody that really seeing Star Wars and then seeing this two months later, the possibility of making films and really wanting to do this and be a part of this for real was was being solidified in my brain. So I've tried to explain to people that Star Wars and this movie are really what what set me on a career path. Interesting. Even so, at that age, you realized that somebody had to create that. Oh yeah, no, I was no because my first heroes were George Powell, who made War of the Worlds, the producer, and Ray Harryhausen, who did like all the stop motion animation. I mean, I I knew the names because by this time I was reading Starlog magazine, I was reading Famous Monsters, I was reading Cine Fantastique, even though there was too much text in it, so I'd, it would scare me. I'm like, I'm not gonna read that article. <laughs> but uh, um, the the no, I was but. But it, it was it was most of the time, you know, I was seeing Disney movies. When I'd see Logan's Run, that was mind blowing. But you'd get to go to the theater, and it's not like my parents were. I didn't get a lot of choice in what I was seeing. Like James Bond, I'm like, ooh, I knew there was a new James Bond movie coming out, but it wasn't like I was scouring the newspaper. Right, and there weren't that many movies coming out every year. It was much less than what recently. Well, there were, but it's just that they were more. If you're a kid, you either see the like Disney live action movies, like Treasure of Matacumbe <laughs> or the the latest Herbie movie or something, and oh, one, Herbie. One, Herbie the Love Bugger, Herbie goes bananas, or Herbie goes to Monte <laughs> yeah. Carlo, or, you know, or something like that. But I remember those. But but yeah, I mean, and and my parents would take me uh, the Apple Dumpling Gang, you know, <laughs> yes. you'd you'd go see all of those things. I didn't see them in the theater though. I would would go to them, but but I I didn't get a lot of say because I was a kid, you know. But the things that I loved, like I would see commercials, like Logan's Run, I had to see because as a Star Trek fan, when I'd see something on TV, if there was anything, any hint of like Jaws, I had. But Jaws, I didn't see until it was playing for months. I mean, that was a big, a big deal. But but you know, I was ten, and then ten. Uh... Yeah, you know what. Actually, I think I was ten. I wasn't eleven. I you turned ten because I, I was five when this movie. I came turned out. ten. I'm I'm wrong. I just turned ten. Yeah, you were. I 10. saw Star Wars, and I uh, yes, I turned. I just turned ten, so I wasn't eleven. I was ten years old seeing this. So it was Star Wars and Spy Love Me, and I turned mm-hmm. ten, and like being ten, that was a big deal. But like I was a weebelow. I was no longer just a Cub Scout. I was now when you were ten, you could be a weebelow. <laughs> So it was Cub Scouts, and then Weebelows, and then Boy Scouts. So you were old enough to go see James Bond. Yeah. Well, uh, there hadn't been a James Bond movie since uh, since uh, Mouth Golden Gun in 74. And then I was seven. Yeah. And I'd watched James Bond movies, but I wasn't... I For whatever reason, at seven, I wasn't aware that there was a James Bond movie that came out. Well, seven, come on. I knew The Exorcist was coming out because I heard the radio ads. Oh my god. But anyway, it was a big deal. Wow. So of course, uh the big battle happens, they get the American sub out, they rescue the sailors, the Lapara sinks and Bond takes off on a wet bike. <laughs> Q <laughs> yeah, has sent him that, a wet that bike. That was mailed to him. It was mailed to him by Q. They put it together <laughs> in like five minutes. It's all well it cuts it goes together quickly. I guess so. And uh, and so he goes over to the uh, to Atlantis. He goes to Atlantis. And um, to rescue the Russian girl, even though she wants to kill him. Well, she also wants to live. 
So you know, Bond Bond has his 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 final confrontation with Stromberg. Yes. You know, the third time he's seen him in the and movie. And that's a scene I remember too, the gun with the tube right. at the end of the table. <laughs> but even as a kid, it's like Bond sticks his gun in the, the where the, the thing came out. It's like, come on, man. You got a Walter PPK and you're supposed to shoot through Stromberg's gun? It doesn't matter. You, you go with it. <laughs> yes, I mean, you do. But you even as a 10-year-old, I'm like, come on, man. Really? Why don't you... I thought it was cool. Well, yeah, it was It was, It was. was cool. It makes no sense at all. <laughs> a lot of this movie doesn't make sense. Sure it does. <sighs> this, movie, there's, this movie is awesome. <laughs> I do love it. So anyway, yeah, so he kills Stromberg, and then he tries to find um, the Russian girl. And um, Jaws, he runs into Jaws. And, um, and then they have a fight. Of course, and then he ends up in this tube that turns around. And he well, no, up, yeah, but he escapes. He, so he throws up, Jaws. He gets Jaws. He uses a magnet and magnetizes his mouth. Yes, which is a scene that I very much remember as a kid. I thought that was so cool. And then dropped him into the water, and instead of getting eaten by the sharks, he he bites the shark and kills the shark. That was amazing. And then Bond rescues Triple X. Especially that I was traumatized by Jaws. I was like, oh my god, that guy killed a shark. Jaws was really, when you're a kid, Jaws was really scary. Oh, it scared the shit out of me. I was so scared. Yeah. And I wasn't even supposed to watch it. I was, my parents had put me to bed and I was just watching from around the corner. And they told me not to, but I did. I did that a lot. My mom would watch TV after my bedtime and I would <laughs> yeah. sneak out and just sit in the, in the yeah. hallway and see, like sometimes she'd be watching something. I, it wouldn't matter what it was, you know, and you you were like, I wonder what happened in this. Uh-huh. I did that a lot, too. So then, of course... Uh, so, uh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, he ends up getting rid of that guy, and then he goes to find the Russian girl, finds her, and then by then, the hour is up, and um, they shoot the missiles at Atlantis. They torpedo Atlantis because they have to. Shane Rimmer does. Yep. And it starts flooding, and they have to escape, and they find this escape pod, which is a giant buoy. <laughs> like the kind that you put on the end of your fishing line. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that as a kid, too. I was like, oh. And then they get in there, and she wants to kill him, but then he finds champagne, and all is good. Well, he says, are you going to kill me? <laughs> you know, are you going to are you gonna kill me? And And... Yeah. No, and and they start getting it on. They get it on. <clears throat> and and then their recover the recovery ship is there, and it's great because there's Frederick Gray. Yeah. There's M. There's General Gogol. Yes, and they see them in the little window. And oh, double oh seven. <laughs> what are you doing? Trip. I love. I love when. Uh, I, I love uh, Walter Gotel's triple X. <laughs> the way, whatever the way he says it, his his Russian accent's great. Well, her 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 sign is triple X. Come uh, on, man. I know it's one of the greatest. What bond, do you expect from her? One, one of triple uh, X is the greatest seventies. <laughs> there wasn't anything triple X until the seventies, so she might as well be triple X. <laughs> and um, um, uh, and it's I love Bond's response. What are you doing? I'm keeping the British end up, sir. <laughs> and then and then it's great because the 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 curtains come down, yeah. and then you hear mm. this like like naval choir. Nobody does it better. <laughs> da, 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 da. Yes, it's like a Broadway. Yeah, the big band makes me feel sad for the rest. <laughs> and it's it's and then the credits start to roll. It's great. <laughs> so Elizabeth, what did you think of this movie? <sighs> it's good fun. <laughs> okay, but what did you think of, of Roger Moore's portrayal of Bond? Yes, I think Roger Moore is a very good Bond. He's got the charm and the swagger and he's handsome and yeah, he's like a great Bond. And I, I actually think he is really good as Bond in this film. He's yeah. different than Connery. He's more debonair, but he's also he's also thoughtful when he has to be. He's still having a good time. He's being playful, but there is a side to him that he he's a different Bond. He's a different Bond, but I like him as well as Sean Connery as Bond. You like him as much as Sean Connery? Almost like they're close. Come on, what I about? mean, this, these are the first. Okay, the Sean, these. Um, I thought Sean Roger Connery Moore, was your jam. Well, I love Sean Connery because he's Zed, and he will always be James Bond. 
and Zed. And Zed. Okay. But the Roger Moore films are the first ones that I saw right. on TV. And so for me, that was the first Bond that I saw. But with that said, I mean, there's Sean Connery and then there's Roger Moore. Okay, well, now let me ask you. We, we watch Goldfinger and watch Our Majesty's Secret Service. In, in comparing this film to those two, how does this measure up, and what are some of the what are some of the things that you? I mean, now now the Bond franchise we're ten films in to the Bond franchise at this point, one of the most wildly successful franchises in cinema history up to this point. The fact that we're ten films in, they've made a film almost every other year. There there was three years between Man with the Golden Gun and Spy Who Loved Me, but so how does this rank? Like, what are some of the things that you've noticed between Goldfinger, Honor, Majesty's Secret Service, and this? that you can compare and contrast? What are some of the things that you might have noticed in this film that might not have been in the others? Or what about this movie feels different than Goldfinger and, and Honor Majesty's Secret Service? I don't know about different, but it's always the same premise. Like, there's always this evil, maniacal, evil guy who's trying to take over the world. Which, when you're a kid, like, that's just fascinating and exciting. But how does it play for you now as an adult? Um, It's... It's different watching it as an adult, um, but you have to watch it with the idea that it's over the top, which it is. And as a kid, like you, you almost take it seriously. Like, oh, oh yeah, I take it very seriously. So cool, you think like this is the coolest guy in the world. Like he is so amazing. <laughs> well, I just find it, you know, it's very interesting to to see where Bond has come to now. I mean, the Daniel Craig films are so... They, they're much more realistic, set in the real world. They're yeah. more dour. Yes. They're, I mean, it's just a stylistic thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, and also, when Bond started out, both Dr. No and From Russia With Love are very much spy thrillers, Cold War thrillers. They hark back more to the... Even though Dr. No's got science fiction elements to it, uh, For Your Eyes Only really doesn't. I mean, uh, uh, From Russia With Love really doesn't, but... But Goldfinger gets a little bit more broad in terms of the wacky stuff. I mean, the Bond films have wacky stuff. But this this is, looking back on this now, even I understand that, that for a franchise that's now 58 years old. Wow. Um, 58 years old. And, <laughs> and the styles of the eras in which they were made, it's funny because having grown up with this kind of thing, you know, you can never let it go. It's always part of your DNA if yeah, you saw it as a kid. Sure. And, 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 and I, I'm always fascinated by how people of today... Because I have a lot of people writing me letters they've never watched Bond movies. Oh, which And they're wow. like, oh, I'm just starting going through the Bond films. And it, it's interesting to hear from people now going yeah. back and watch. I, I mean, I find it... I'm always curious. Like, what do audiences who are seeing these Bond films, 60s Bond films and 70s Bond films... For the first time, who might be thirty years old? Yeah, like they were born in nineteen ninety. Right, that would be an interesting. We should we should test it out on Sophie. Yeah, I mean, but she knows. She looks. She understands film stock. She's like, oh, this looks like an old movie. Right. And the visual effects. Some people can't get past that. Uh, but I mean, see, I lo I love I love the goofiness. I love the goofy parts, and I mean, there's some really goofy stuff in these movies. But when you're a kid, you don't think they're goofy. You think they're But these they're movies amazing. weren't made for... They were made for general audiences. They're not kids' movies. No, I know. Well, I don't mean goofy in the sense of, like, like stupid for kids. I mean, like, you know, these villains are over the top. And they their maniacal plans are always, like, really weird. <laughs> Which is wonderful. Well, the next movie, uh, Hugo Drax is going to use poison orchids. <laughs> <laughs> to kill everybody on Earth. See, I He's love He's going to drop them from orbit. Because <laughs> so, why not? That's so great. It is great. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> I, I know it is. Well, okay. So we do have a lot of... We got a lot of letters. Yeah. To read. Um, so <clears throat> let's see what we got here. We got letter... We, I think we have like three letters to read. Uh, this first letter comes from Jason Webster. 
Uh, I hope yourself, Elizabeth, and everybody within the Post Geek Singularity have enjoyed the weekend, and I look forward to the week ahead with fresh energy and vigorous enthusiasm. I'm glad both yourself and Elizabeth will be discussing Honor Majesty's Secret Service for Whining About Movies 93, while Thunderball is my... F I haven't read this before, have I? While Thunderball is my, fa so. my favorite Bond film, and I believe From Russia With Love is the best of the Bond films starring Sean Connery, I regard Honor Majesty's Secret Service to be the best film of the Bond franchise and my second favorite of the long-running franchise. It appears I'm not alone in this. In September 2012, fans of 007 Magazine selected Honor Majesty's Secret Service as the best Bond film in the franchise in a poll. Wow. Noted director Steven Soderbergh and Christopher Nolan love Honor Majesty's Secret Service and consider the film a favorite and the best film of the franchise of OHMSS. Soderbergh wrote, For me, there's no question that cinematically Honor Majesty's Secret Service is the best Bond film and the only one worth watching repeatedly for reasons other than pure entertainment. Shot to shot, this movie is beautiful in a way none of the other Bond films are. I might agree with that, I think. This, despite the film having received a lukewarm re reception by critics upon its theatrical release, Honor Majesty's Secret Service was the second highest grossing film worldwide for 1969 and finished ninth at the U.S. domestic box office for the year. In fact, during its theatrical run in the U.S., Honor Majesty's Secret Service outgrossed its nearest competitor two to one. The film accumulated a worldwide return of 87 million U.S. against a $7 million budget. That's a huge success. There are many reasons why I regard the film to be the best of the whole franchise. George Lazenby is good as James Bond, as he was convincing in the action scenes, as he was physically imposing with a rugged suaveness, yet able to convey a vulnerability that would not have suited Connery's interpretation of the character. Diana Rigg was an established actress on stage and screen when she landed the role of Contessa Teresa Tracy DeVincenzo, and she was able to bring all of her expertise to the role. She has remained the best Bond girl of the franchise. There is genuine chemistry between Bond and Tracy. Telly Savalas was great as Blofeld, imbuing the character with a charisma, intelligence, and sneering deviousness that continues to make him one of the more memorable villains in the history of the long-running franchise. I agree with that. The riveting exchange between Blofeld and Bond as he reveals his plan to use bacteri bacteriological warfare to hold the world at ransom is the best of the whole series. The cinematography by Michael Reed is stunning, using low-key, muted, and natural lighting to supreme effect to capture the natural, realistic feel. The establishing shots of the locales, especially Piz Gloria, are breathtaking. The film looks like a genuine spy thriller. The ski chase sequence is one of the best of the whole series. It's easily the best and closest adaptation of one of Ian Fleming's original novels. And the score is one of the best in the whole series. And who could ever forget Louis B. Armstrong's we have all the time in the world. Armstrong possessed the best and most distinctive smoky singing voice ever heard. His voice was perfect for blues and jazz. I can listen to him and Rod Stewart all day. Though George Lazenby uh, uh, copped criticism for not being Sean Connery, it is worth noting that both Connery himself and Roger Moore genu genuinely praised his performance as good. Connery also leapt to Lazenby's defense when Broccoli labeled the Australian as arrogant, with the Scot being labeled, being quoted as saying, I've never known George to be that type of person. Connery told Lazenby he was impressed with the Australian's performance as Bond in Honor Majesty's Secret Service. You know, I got to meet George Lazenby and hang out with him. What? Yeah, he came to a screening of Shoot 'em Up, Michael Davis's movie Shoot 'em Up. Wow. Yeah, he was, what a w w really nice guy. That's amazing. George Lazenby did a fine job in portraying James Bond when one considers he had no professional experience as an actor. He'd served in the Royal Australian Army and worked as a car salesman before moving to London where he worked as a car salesman before breaking into modeling. He'd appeared in a commercial for Fry's Turkish Delight when he decided to try out for the role of James Bond. Due to his military background, he handled the fight and action sequences with ease. There's even a well-known fact that during his audition for the part, there was a screen test of a fight scene in which Lazenby knocked the stuntman out. Lazenby imbues Bond with a rugged toughness, yet emotional vulnerability. During his escape from Piz Gloria and Rosa Klebb and the henchmen, there's a look, the look of a genuine concern on Bond's face while hiding amongst the crowd, as I said that on the show, uh, at the skating rink before he escapes with Tracy. Then there's the end scene, which packs real and raw emotional weight, Bond cradles emotionless Tracy, and it's a real gut punch. It was solid, if not great, performance <coughs> by Lazenby, and the producers of the franchise actually wanted to sign him to a multi-film contract, which he turned down due to bad advice from his manager, Ronan O'Reilly. 
Lazenby showed commitment to acting as a career, as several sources have claimed he studied acting at Durham University after appearing in Honor Majesty's Secret Service. One can only wonder how both Diamonds Are Forever and Live and Let Die would have turned out if he had the opportunity to learn and work with director Guy Hamilton. I believe he really would have grown into the role, and the contemporary view would be that he was good as Bond. Thank you for discussing on Her Majesty's Secret Service, a film that is now getting its due from positive reassessments by contemporary critics and general viewers alike. Sincerely, Jason Webster. What a great letter. What do you think about yeah, that, babe? Yeah, really good letter. Do you agree? Yeah, I think if he had he had continued to play Bond, he would have gotten better and better. Um, yeah, I mean, I think emotionally he was really good. Like, the end scene was very... Uh, Heart wrenching. It felt real. Like he, he felt really like um, broken up about. I know losing her. So, um, but I, I didn't think his acting was great throughout the film. Well, no. But I think I think I think if he had continued to be Bond, he would have definitely grown into it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. This next letter comes from Joe Dick. Joe Dick writes. Hi, Robin Elizabeth. My introduction to Bond was the Brosnan Bond in the 90s. I have a fondness for these movies and that portrayal, but when I saw my first Connery Bond, I realized he is the best. In a way, it does make me feel sad for the rest. <laughs> Nobody does it half as good as you, Joe Dick. Although I love Goldfinger, there are some valid criticisms. The verisimilitude is either very high for this movie or very low. High verisimilitude in-universe, low if you were somehow expecting a realistic spy movie. At that point in the franchise, it seems unlikely anyone would have expected too much realism, but there's enough. Goldfinger had planned to kill those gangsters anyway. It was pointless to detail his entire plan. Luckily he did for Bond and the viewer, but there must have been a better way to get this information across. Goldfinger is quite mad and a megalomaniac, of course. Verisimilitude takes a hit when Bond kills a guy in a bathtub by throwing a lamp into it, and when Jill Mist Masterson is suffocated with gold paint. We don't breathe through our skin, so that wouldn't work. Kill her another way and spill paint uh, and still paint her gold because it looks cool, but it still works. How do you know our skin doesn't breathe? How no, do you actually, know? Actually, your skin does breathe. Yeah, I, I, I think, but that's the and thing. You I can be suffocated. I believed suffocated. it. Yeah, no, it's, it's coolness real. is the justification for so much in Bond and in life. Yes, it is, including the plan to kill Bond with a laser instead of shooting him. Goldfinger's speech is unnecessary. Killing the gangster who opted out was unnecessary. The car is crushed. Then all the evidence and the gold brought back to Goldfinger. Coolness is the justification again, so we don't care. It was unnecessary. And it was nice to have another example of how not everything Bond does works out. His message isn't delivered. There's a few laughs, too. Some of the humor is from Bond's now dated attitudes and behavior towards women. In Miami, when Felix Leiter shows up, Bond dismisses his masseuse, even giving her a playful slap on the ass. I can imagine how much heat a movie would take for that today, rightly so. Yeah, but secretly women would be like... What? Just Stop kidding. it. <laughs> Just kidding. As a name, Pussy Galore is a bit on the nose, even for a Bond film of the era. But it was nice to see a woman who at least tried to resist Bond's super stud charm. I've heard she was a lesbian, Bond turned straight, but I never got the sense she was supposed to be a lesbian, only that she was immune to his charms, or at least tried to resist them. In Casino Royale, Vesperlind accurately says Bond sees women as disposable pleasures. No doubt, Pussy knew his type, but in the end, she of course couldn't resist him. By the time Bond returns in Thunderball, he will have dropped her, or she will have dropped him. I did wonder how close Pussy's Flying Circus would have got to a 1964 Fort Knox without being shot down, but again, I didn't care about that. A Bond movie today would be held to a much higher standard. Is that a good thing? I don't know, is it? I don't know... A valid criticism could be made of the dubbing quality for Goldfinger's voice. We hear Gert Frabba's real voice during the meeting of the gangsters, and he was understandable. I love that in Goldfinger, Bond is not superhuman. He fails several times and can't do everything alone. Someone else even has to disarm the bomb, and he only survives the laser by talking his way out. The fight with Oddjob was a bit disappointing, but had an epic finish. Goldfinger is overall a nice mix of realism and insane Bond movie magic. <laughs> so while I said the verisimilitude took a hit now and again, within the context of a Bond movie, it works. Later Bond movies sometimes get this balance wrong, which is why they felt the need to scale things back with Casino Royale. In Skyfall, his only gadgets are a gun and a radio. 
I hope this hasn't seemed too critical. I don't want to sound like comic book guy from The Simpsons. <laughs> I love Goldfinger. Any viewer will notice some implausible and or ridiculous things, but won't care. I believed it all within the context of a Bond film of the era, so I guess the verisimilitude is very high in the end. It's definitely obviously a classic, and that image of the gold-painted Shirley Eaton is obviously classic too. And of course, it has one of the all-time great Bond theme songs as well. My verdict four glasses <laughs> awesome. well thank you joe dick what do you think of joe's letter i loved that letter i thought it was really good this other letter i'm gonna save i'll read that later because it's very long um so let's go back and see what people are saying um so i'll read john ortiz's tomorrow on the show because that refers to something that was on roberto suarez is here he's going to be with us for gold golden eye Okay. Roberto says, some bits of trivia I researched for tonight's episode. The movie was directed by Lewis Gilbert, who had previously directed You Only Live Twice. Both films share similar plot elements. Spaceships are stolen to instigate nuclear war in the earlier film. Fleming's original novel was an experimental first-person narrative from the point of view of a Bond girl. Due to its poor reception, he only authorized the title of the novel to be used when he sold the film rights. The only element carried over from the novel were the characters of the henchmen, Sandor and Jaws. In the novel, they were two mobsters called Slugsy and Horror. That's true. Respectively, described as a short, bald man and a tall man with metal-capped teeth. The script went through several writers, including Jerry Anderson of UFO fame. Yes. Not surprisingly, The Spy Who Loved Me features some very Anderson-esque miniatures, especially the Atlantis base and the Liparis tanker. Or Liparis, but Liparis, whatever. Roberto Suarez goes on to say the original nemesis for this film was supposed to be Blofeld. That is true. It was supposed to be Spectre. Mm. However, Kevin McClory's lawsuit against Eon Productions prevented the studio from using the character and any references to Spectre, so the character of Stromberg was developed instead. Instead of Blofeld, it's Stromberg. Why? Wait, what? Oh, there's a whole... This is a long story. There was a whole... So, Kevin McClory, the producer was developing Thunderball as the first Bond film with Ian Fleming at the same time Cubby Broccoli got involved with the Bond franchise. Uh -huh. Now, Cubby Broccoli and, uh, uh, um, and uh, Harry Saltzman ended up getting the rights. So they were able to use, and Kevin McClory is a producer on Thunderball, which is the fourth Bond film, but then McClory, he spent the rest of his life in legal battles with... Eon Productions and Cubby Broccoli and they could not use Spectre after Diamonds Are Forever oh. and they didn't get the rights back until into the it took 30 years and wow. he, he fought that battle till he died I have a book called The Battle for Bond that's a very uh, interesting book about the oh, whole wow. legal battle um an interesting coincidence is that both Connery and Moore's third Bond films are respectively considered the best of each of their runs as the character. Both also feature the most famous henchmen, Odd Job and Jaws, and vehicles, the Aston Martin and the Lotus Esprit. Roberto goes on to say, You Only Live Twice, The Spy Who Me, and Tomorrow Never Dies are all variations on the same plot. They also feature Bond working with a female spy counterpart from other governments. Japan, Russia, and China. The stunt in the pre-title sequence performed by Rick Sylvester was the most expensive stunt filmed at the time at a cost of half a million dollars. He got paid half a million bucks to wow. jump off. It was, um, it was, um, I want to say it's um, Valhalla Cliff. That was insane. Like that. that was an insane stunt. During the film's premiere, it received a standing ovation led by Prince Charles. Uh, final bit of trivia. Caroline Monroe, who plays the beautiful and deadly helicopter pilot Naomi, would later star in the Italian Star Wars knockoff Star Crash, one of my all-time and Rob's favorite guilty pleasures. <laughs> yes, it is, but I have an action figure of her. Where uh, is it? It's in a box. It's over there. Uh, this movie has had a... Uh, oh, Tim is here. Tim Bula the Spider Monkey is here, and he says, This movie has a few of my firsts. It's my first Moore film, my first Bond song, and my first Bond car. I've always loved the Lotus Esprit even more if it can go underwater. Who doesn't? Roberto goes on to say, if you can't tell by now, this is my all-time favorite Bond film. Me too. Well, it's one of mine. It was the first one I ever saw, and it pretty much started my 40-year fandom and appreciation of Bond. I'm sorry we didn't have you on tonight's show, but we'll have you for Goldeneye. Uh, Ross Gecko goes on to say, 
super cool jacket, Rob, worthy of my five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> People love this jacket. It's it's such an old, like I got this, it's like 20 years old. People love it. George Baker was in pretty much everything on UK television. Uh, Bunyan Snipes says this. His most, his most famous role was that of Inspector Wexford in the Ruth Rendell Mysteries. But to me, he will always be the second number two. It's true. And he was he played Sir Hilary Bray. Um, uh, Tim says, I love that they put a submersible Lotus in Grand Theft Auto Online. Of course, they called it the Stromberg. Of course they did. <laughs> uh, uh, Cal is here. Cal from Swag Props. Hi, guys. I sent a letter about my recent observation about Goldfinger and how Bond failed multiple times in that movie. Be curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I have that. I, you know what? Uh, wait, didn't we read that? I thought we read that. I think we might have read that last the other day. Yeah. I think we did. Um, I might have read that. So, well, there you go. Um, well, there you go. Uh, so what more thoughts do you have on this film? Um, uh, it was fun. I enjoyed it. It was, you know, it made me feel... Like a kid again. Well, what's interesting is our next movie is The Living Daylights. Yeah. Which was is 10 years later. Yeah. And it's Timothy Dalton's first Bond. And we're, we're, you'll see... I like Living Daylights a lot. Because I hated View to a Kill, the last Roger Moore Bond film. And it starts to... It starts to get into more... familiar territory it becomes a little bit more generic as far as action films go mm, okay. i mean especially on the heels of 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 rambo first blood part two yeah uh it, it it got to the afghanistan the mujahideen first but it's interesting to see the bond film the bond franchise as it moved into the 80s i think it kind of lost its way yeah i remember not loving <clears throat> um his his bond I, I like you. I think you're going to like it when we watch it again. It'll be interesting. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't remember the movies. I know I saw them. Right. And I remember that I didn't love him as Bond, but we'll see second go around. Yeah. I mean, I'll be curious. I mean, I don't know if we're going to... Do you have time tomorrow? Are we going to... Tomorrow or Friday? Oh, yeah. Tomorrow's Thursday? Yeah. Do you have a lot well, of work? Friday, I can't. You can't. I okay. have two classes. I so tomorrow we'll keep our date tomorrow. Yeah. For Living Daylights. Okay. And then Golden Eye will be Saturday, and then we we finish up on Monday with Skyfall with Daniel Craig. Right. And Claude. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that'll be our that we will have watched, and then we're doing Austin Powers on Austin Wednesday. Powers. We're doing. I mean, we're either gonna do the first one, Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery, or we do Gold Member. I mean, I, I don't know what you... I love Goldmember, but I think we should probably do the first Austin Powers. Yeah, yeah, I think the first one. Um, Hang on. Black Philip Alvarez is here mm -hmm. and says, "There's a, That's a rad jacket, Rob. You look like the Fonz. Ayy. <laughs> Ayy. Yeah, but the Fonz had a black regular... I mean, this is... It was is, black, yeah. This is like a... a, a Are yes. you going to jump the shark? <laughs> Am I gonna? Yeah, in in my jacket, in my jacket. He did jump the shark. He did jump yeah, the shark. All. I think he was wearing his jacket. Yeah, I know it's true. So I mean, it, it's very interesting. Like I've loved the Bond franchise, and we're doing this because No Time to Die was well. We had the best tickets in April, and it was supposed to come out in April, and then it was supposed <clears> to come <throat> out in November, and now it's not going to come out until next April. So maybe, we, maybe. <clears throat> Hey, you know what? Mm. Pfizer's got their, their, we'll see what happens. I mean, you know, the world's crazy. Well, the vaccine, you know, they're saying it's 90%. Uh, 90%, yeah. And what are the long-term effects? They don't know. Well, I, I'm not going to be one know? of the first people lining up for that vaccine. Stop, a vac don't discourage people. Stop it. I'm not discouraging people, but a vaccine that was rapidly prototyped or whatever, and there, it was done quickly, and there's a lot of money involved. Never a good combination. I'd rather wait and see. I'll take it in a year. <laughs> We've been sheltering at home for a long time. Yeah. I don't mind waiting. We shall see. Well, I mean, uh, 
we're over our time. As always. As always. <laughs> we, we are over our time. So, I mean, what are, what are some of your concluding thoughts on The Spy Who Loved Me? I, I told you my thoughts. I thought it was fun. It was very, you know, it's a James Bond movie. It's, you know. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, when you go back and you look at these movies now, you know, we watch Amelie or we, we talk about The English Patient or we talk about the movies we like. When you watch these movies now, do they have any value? Or are they disposable childhood fantasies that we but, look at well, nostalgic, well, nostalgically? I mean, you can't. You can't throw them out. I mean, if nostalgia is is a part of life, and I know it is, um, and that's not a bad thing. No, I know, but I'm 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 curious. Like like, do these movies have any value for people today? Like, if you if you were say you put yourself in your sixteen you're sixteen years old, and you're sixteen years old today, you've got your phone on, you know you. You're, you're, you've got all your apps open. You got Instagram open. You got all this stuff going on. And do you think, with that kind of culture, as a 16 year old you today, could you find any value in this movie? How am I supposed to answer that? I am not a teenager. I'm asking you to, you know, hypothetically extrapolate. It, it, it depends on the person. I mean, there are some young people who would find this very interesting and entertaining and would enjoy these films but then there are some that would hate them and and not even spend five minutes watching them see i i mean i i've been talking about this a little bit on my show i have this feeling that the bond franchise should end i know you keep saying that i mean i really think that no time to die would be and as long as they can make money but i do think that that they keep getting it's like these franchises that have lasted 50 years plus that were born out of, even Star Trek, was born out of a time when people still believed in the Camelot spirit of the Kennedy White House going to the moon and all that. And now everybody's trying to make these franchises um, relevant to today. You know, they're, they're injecting how people feel today rather than make these sort of universal, more Joseph Campbell heroic archetype movies it's like no 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 let's take these things where, where people were true heroes let's humanize them and make them more like oh bond's full of angst you know and i'm like but he's not really yeah you know he's he, he was never really full of angst right and and the daniel craig films after after um casino royale you know, everybody's. It, it's. I was. I am your. I'm the architect of your pain, James. You know, it's. It's. I. I don't know why. Why they want to do this? Why do they want to inject all of this into these? The into these flights of fancy. It's weird to me. It is weird. It is weird. Um, but then, so you end Bond, and then what? Well, that's the whole thing. If Bond makes money, they're not going to end him. You know, they'll, they'll reinvent him. But the problem is, the character of James Bond... Like, Sherlock Holmes can be reinvented because he's a detective. Right. You know, and but the, the thing is, James Bond is literally a product of the Cold War. Where you had nation states, yeah, but, like but communism... Agents, agents still exist today. They do, but now we have the villains. The villains are no longer... The villains are people that live in the desert. You know, they're in caves in Afghanistan. Okay. And 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 there are these religious zealots that don't believe. Like, how well, do you here, fight a villain but, that but wants to burn if, down? The... If they kept Bond in the fantasy realm, you could have these weird maniacal evil would, guys uh, that are not terrorists. They just want to take over the world, you know, by poisoning people with orchids or you know, like <laughs> orchid a negro. Yeah, I mean. I think yes, they're becoming. They're trying to connect it too much to what's going on in the world today. That's a different movie, but it's already moved that way. So. Uh, well, I mean, that's why I think when you have something like The Kingsman, you know, which yeah. has become the fantasy realm, you know, the the. And I, I, I just wonder. I mean, I wonder. I, I because a lot of these things that I grew up with, that I'm still a fan of. I find myself increasingly alienated as they try and make them more of the modern age. 
And I just don't think they work well, anymore. Well, they're just trying to get people to watch them. You right. Know? Right. But. And um, they're guessing that people nowadays don't want to see fantastical secret agents. Which is sad. I want to see more fantastical secret agents. I, I do too, but that's because we grew up with it. Yeah. But, you know, kids with the technology now, it's, it's anyway, subterfuge. Anyway, uh, um, Raygun, hello, sir. Raygun Media Production says, This was also my first Bond viewing at the cinema. Add Close Encounters, Star Wars, and Jaws. Suddenly I wanted to learn to make movies. Yep. I mean, Jaws was 75, but the other ones, Close Encounters, Star Wars, this, Spy Love Me, they all came out in 1977. Spy Lo it was Star Wars, Spy Love Me, and Close Encounters came out at holiday of 77. So, yeah. I mean, that's that's what it was like. Yeah. Well, yeah. anyway, I guess we'll end this episode. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I want to point out that um, in the next two days, we'll drop our my new show. Uh, let's talk, let's get physical media. And Jason Spriggs, uh, Ray Gun Media Productions, did some graphics for us. Yeah, so cool. I want to thank him for those. They're, they're great. Now I'm editing furiously. Hopefully I can finish it tonight. Maybe. Um, and then we're doing our next show tomorrow night. Yeah. We're jumping ahead a decade. A yeah. decade into the 80s. Post the 80s. John Rambo. Post Commando. We're going to the Living Daylights when they when they recast Bond as Timothy Dalton. Right. Timothy Dalton. And uh, I like Living Daylights. It's the last time John Barry, the great John Barry, scored. I mean, he didn't score this movie, but he meant a lot to the Bond franchise. So we will be, I guess, tomorrow night. Yeah. We'll be back tomorrow night. The Living Daylights. Aha! Sung the theme song. So anyway... Um, now we we've come to it, Elizabeth. Yep. We gotta rate it. Yes, we rate one to four glasses. Yeah. What is our? We have our bottoms up scale. One to four glasses because there are four glasses in a bottle. Mm. <coughs> and on a scale of one to four glasses, what would you give the Spy Who Loved Me? I'm gonna give this three. Three glasses. Three glasses. I gotta go three point five. Even though in my mind and my imagination and my heart, this is a four-star movie. So give it four. No, but I, I just can't. I can't give it four stars. I can't. I, I, I mean... You I, gave Golden uh, I Goldfinger. Goldfinger. You gave Goldfinger. Goldfinger gets four stars. You gave it four stars. Yeah, Goldfinger gets four stars. <laughs> and, okay. And as much... No, as much as I love this movie, I got to give it three and a half stars. Okay. I gave it three. So three, three and a half stars. There we go. It's funny. I, I I should actually go back and look and see and put the ratings on each each yeah. film. Like we don't, we never put we that never. up. We never do that. So here's to Lewis Gilbert's Spy Love Me, 1977. Cheers to that. Uh, as always, I want to thank our moderators. I want to thank Mike Bodden. I want to thank Greg Smith. I want to thank the Richard. Please go visit the Richard. Uh, he's always throwing watch parties and Zoom parties on the Post Geek Singularity Facebook page and the Whining About Movies Facebook page. Um, uh, let's see who else is here. Uh, MC Black Cap is here. Bunyan Snipe is here from the UK. How are you not sleeping, Bunyan Snipe? <laughs> I, I never know. Yeah, but it's James Bond. Come it is in. James Bond. So, And Joshua Levesque is here. Thank you all. We have the greatest moderators on YouTube. And Black Philip Alvarez. Wait, did I miss? Oh, he thought I was. Uh, uh, yes, no, we you, read. You did miss his letter. No, no, I didn't miss his letter. We read. I think I read it on my show. We didn't miss it. You we didn't did. read it on this show. I think we did. No, you read it to me privately. Maybe that's why you think. Did I? Oh well, we'll have to find it again. Well, I want to thank the moderating staff. Thank you very much. I want to thank everybody that generously supports the channel through uh, super chats and tips and all that and members people that have become members of the channel thank you uh, very much for all that yes thank you and remember the imagination connoisseur film festival is still going on you can still make a movie even if you make a four minute you know think about making a tiktok video but making it three times as long yeah you can do that you can join us tomorrow here same bat time same bat channel we'll try and make it at 7 30 yeah 
7.30, and we're going to do the Living Daylights. You must have scared the Living Daylights out of her. So yeah, I think so. That's what we're going to do. All right, then, so take us out. Everyone you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear, and all you have to do is listen. Listen, all you have to do is listen. And what else? Have a better night. Have a butter knife. Thank you so much for that. We will see you tomorrow. I am not on John Campy's show tomorrow. Rob Observations will be back at 2. And then we'll be back here tomorrow night at 7.30. Yes, we will. So there you go. And hopefully, um, Let's Get Physical Media will eventually debut. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you for joining us. See you tomorrow.